Good evening. My name is Doug Kinchy. I'm the director of the Kaufman Interfaith Institute. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here for the annual Siegel Lecture. We're very pleased to have our speaker, who will be introduced in a little bit, uh, with us. She's been here for two days meeting with various groups on campus and in the community. And we're looking forward to her remarks this evening. But I want to say a few words about what the Kaufman Institute is doing these days. Many of you know that in 2012, when we launched our community effort with the Year of Interfaith Understanding and had over 300 events in churches and mosques and synagogues and uh, with the symphony and with uh, museums and the college campuses, that was what I call the understanding was involving the head. In 2015, we had our Year of Interfaith Service in which we brought various interfaith communities together with the service organizations, food pantries, uh, Habitat for Humanity, uh, environment groups, to work together on, as people from different faith traditions to be of service to our community. I call it using our hands. So we've used our head and our hands. Guess what's left? Use our hearts. And so this year we've announced the 2018 Year of Interfaith Friendship. And the way in which we're carrying that out is with a series of affinity groups. We're bringing people together around common interests. We want them to come from different religions. We're not asking you to come together to talk about religion. We're asking you to come together and be, make friends, but friends across various lines that you might not normally have made friendship with. We have a dozen of them running right now, and we hope to plan more. We have everything from a fitness group that like to get together and take walks or exercise together. We got a foodies group uh, who like to go out to interesting restaurants and at their next meeting, they're gonna get together and cook. I think the foodies group is gonna later join the fitness group. <laughs> <laughs> we have a cinema group that every month, there's a cinema that we pick at, at Celebration Woodland. And uh, then there's a panel and discussion after, afterwards. Uh, we've got a chess group, we've got book reading groups, we've got a scriptural reasoning group, we've got a group that's doing art together. Anyway, there's a whole series of them. And if you want to learn more about it, it's not too difficult to find that information. All you need to do is go to www.interfaithunderstanding, one word, interfaithunderstanding.org and click on the banner that says 2018 Year of Interfaith Understanding, and that'll take you to all the affinity groups and when the next meeting is gonna be and, and even a sign up page so that we can contact you with more information. Anyway, uh, this is an exciting project for us and we're very, very thankful for the support and interest that we've had from the community as we build these friendships. The other thing that we want to announce is that one week from tonight will be the annual Abrahamic dinner, which this year will be at Temple Emmanuel, a Jewish temple in town. Uh, we are taking a little different approach. We're the calling it listening to new voices because we have three women who are going to be speaking on behalf of the Christian, Muslim, and Jewish faith and giving a woman's perspective on that. And those of you that get uh, the Interfaith Insight, uh, you uh, may have seen some today. Yeah, it's already gone out. Uh, I wrote the column this, this week about the women in our religious histories. And that'll be in the Grand Rapids Press on Thursday for those of you that read it in the press. By the way, if you don't get the newsletter uh, and want to get it, go to interfaithunderstanding.org and there's a place to sign up for the Interfaith Insights. Uh, at this point, I want to introduce uh, Fred Stella, who is the president of the Interfaith Dialogue Association. Fred was the Fred and the Interfaith Dialogue Association were the ones that created the Rabbi Siegel lecture. Rabbi Siegel, he'll tell us more about it, but it was my privilege to meet him back in the early '80s before he died. He was. Uh, Rabbi at, am I stealing all your thunder? <laughs> he was a rabbi at the conservative uh, Havas Israel. He died, unfortunately, way too young. And uh, we're, we're pleased that Interfaith Dialogue Association, now joined with the Kaufman Institute, has created this annual Rabbi Siegel Memorial Lectureship. Fred? Thank you, Doug, and thank all of you for coming here. Every time we assemble 
at one of these uh, Siegel Memorial Lectures, we are paying homage to a great interfaith pioneer, Rabbi Philip Siegel. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about him and how this, this uh, happened to be. Uh, rabbi Siegel was the, uh, was the rabbi of Havas Israel, the conservative synagogue in town, and he was I, perhaps not unique, but he was rare. He was uh, an interfaith pioneer, as I've mentioned, and to explain just exactly what that means is that not only was he a rabbi, he also had a doctorate in New Testament theology. He, he was one person who would claim that if you wanted to understand first century Judaism, you had to have a working knowledge of the New Testament. That, that's what he believed. And he was able to teach the New Testament as a rabbi uh, and do so very successfully. He uh, published uh, a number of works. And uh, one of my favorites that I would recommend for those who are inclined was it's, uh, it's called uh, The Halakha of Jesus uh, According to the Gospel of Matthew. As many of you know, uh, Matthew was the most Jewish of the Gospels. It's in Matthew that you uh, find more references to the Hebrew prophets, uh, more acknowledgments of the law, and a lot of people don't know this, but if you look, you'll see that in Matthew, Jesus ate a lot better than in the rest of the Gospels. <laughs> so it truly is the most Jewish Gospel. and. Um, he died, unfortunately, much too early. He was the, um, he was the rabbi at Ahavis from 1980 to 85. Uh, and he, he sponsored conferences and talks. This is how I became aware of him, going to Ahavis Israel uh, to hear speakers of different faiths uh, in discussion with Jews. And it was uh, really remarkable. At that time, of course, it was uh, very limited to usually Catholics, Protestants, and Jews. But that's a start. Uh, when he passed away in 1985, his widow Lillian Siegel uh, took up the baton and she co-founded Interfaith Dialogue Association uh, along with uh, two other women, Ghazala Munir, who was, who was Muslim, and Marcin Reinstra, who was Christian. And uh, I was fortunate to meet with them uh, later on and uh, ultimately be in the position of president of Interfaith Dialogue Association and very pleased to now be uh, in concert with the Kaufman Interfaith Institute. Um, and so this has been happening, the, Kauf the uh, Siegel Lecture has been happening now for well over 20 years and we are very grateful to Kaufman because since our association with Kaufman, uh, it's taken it to a new level. And for a while we were doing it biannually, now we are doing it annually. And uh, we are very proud of the caliber of speakers that we've had over the years, and tonight is no exception. Uh, so enjoy, and I'm going to uh, t uh, give things back to Doug, and um, I'm sure we will all be well edified by the end of tonight's event. Thank you. I want to make one more introduction because we have someone that's fairly new to the community. Kevin McIntosh is the new court, interfaith coordinator on campus. Uh, since the Kaufman Institute has been housed now in the Division of Inclusion and Equity, they have created a position, uh, interfaith coordinator, to work with campuses, with students at the Grand Rapids campuses, as well as other campuses in the area. We have interns at Aquinas College, Calvin College, and Hope College, as well as at Grand Valley. And Kevin is a part of our team, he works part-time with Kaufman, but his position is established at the, in the Division of Inclusion and Equity. And uh, Kev, Kevin's a graduate of Emory University and a master's degree at Harvard Divinity School. But the most important thing tonight is that he, his mentor was Susan uh, Henry Crow. And so I'm going to ask Kevin to make the introduction for our guest speaker. Before I introduce our speaker, I told her I'd get this technology set up to so see if I can, there it goes, perfect. 
Uh, as Doug said, I'm Kevin McIntosh, and I have the honor to serve as the coordinator for Campus Interfaith Resources, and also as the Campus Engagement Manager with Kaufman. Before I did that, though, I was a student at Emory, and so it's very uh, apt and very appropriate, I think, that my first interfaith program here for the Grand Rapids community is going full cycle and bringing back Susan Henry Crow, uh, who was the chaplain at Emory when I was a student there. Susan served as the chaplain and dean of religious life for 22 years at Emory University. During that time, she was named uh, chaplain of the year by the United Methodist Church. She was also named a history maker by Emory University. She turned a historically Methodist university into a religiously diverse and pluralistic society open to members of all different religious, spiritual, and secular traditions. At that same time, when she was serving as chaplain, she was nominated and put on the judicial board of the Methodist Church, uh, serving as the first head of that, the first female head of that board, which is the Methodist Church's Supreme Court. After 22 years at Emory University, the Methodist Church uh, took her from us uh, and put her in charge of the uh, board of church and society, which if you're like me and aren't very vested or knowledgeable about Methodist issues or topics, uh, that is the part of the church that really focuses on justice. They push politicians, church leaders, both nationally and globally, to think about the church's principles towards human rights, civil rights, and all other parts of dignity and social justice. Is with that thought and being part of now the inclusion of uh, the division of inclusion and equity and being one of the social justice centers, I thought it was very appropriate to bring Susan to campus and to have this conversation. But how does social justice look when we look at it through a faith-based lens? How does it change when we look and use our spiritual, secular, or religious traditions to think about social justice? So with that, if you'll just join me in welcoming Dr. Susan, Dr. Reverend Susan Henry Crow to the stage. When you began a journey, you really never expect sort of to be old enough to um, have come this far and with people like Kevin. Uh, Kevin, thank you very much. Um, it is really a precious thing to get to be here with all of you tonight and particularly to receive the invitation from you to be here tonight. So thank you so much. It is an honor to be uh, offering the Siegel Lecture. I read about Rabbi Siegel, and it really um, is quite um, a gift to get to do this. It's also pretty rare to get to be in a place that brings several parts of your life together all in the same night. The Kaufman Institute, uh, under the wonderful leadership of Dr. Kenshi, um, is doing marvelous work. I had a good time this afternoon at a round table and seeing the work of the Kaufman Institute and uh, <clears throat> the many things that are happening that have happened and that I am very confident will continue to happen. I had breakfast this morning with President Haas and any president that comes to breakfast to talk about multi-faith interreligious things is pretty special. Um, so I was very honored to have breakfast with him this morning. Um, as it's very clear that um, Grand Valley is very committed to inclusion and to this on beginning and ongoing work in um, inclusion and uh, interfaith life. I also want to thank the colleagues who are responding tonight. Uh, thank you for being here and taking time to um, respond to the things that I say. I am a practitioner. I am not a scholar. Uh, so I will talk in some generalities tonight. Uh, and I am sure that those of you in the room can add uh, some more detail to the scholarly work that I offer. <clears throat> We cannot really talk about justice. We must see it. We must enact it, walk it, gesture, in some cases sing, chant, listen, pray, witness, taste, share, show up, learn how to create space, 
in order for justice to happen. Justice enacted is just an, justice enlivened, and people of faith live justice. For years as the Dean of the Chapel and Religious Life at Emory University, and now serving as the General Secretary of the United Methodist Board of Church and Society, which is the justice agency of the church, has shown me how faith-based imperatives for social justice are so critical. And this journey of faith-based life in interfaith relationships is really quite a journey. Those of us claiming the Abrahamic traditions have a story about journeys. In Genesis 12, we hear the story that you all know. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, your kindred, to the land that I will show you. This journey into a new land is really quite amazing. Here is how my own journey began. The inaugural service as I went to Emory in 1991 was to be an interfaith service, which I would later come to think about in a new way and perhaps might call it a multi-faith service. I was very well-intentioned and pretty naive. To the planning committee with the, the rabbi who was a distinguished faculty member, a Muslim leader from the faculty, a Hindu priest, and a Buddhist scholar, I brought my well-prepared outline. It was characteristically Christian, Western, and Protestant. Those gathered around the table did not even know each other very well and were interested in this experiment of trying out interfaith work. Most of all, they did not want to hurt each other's feelings and were burdened with many histories and narratives themselves and of one another's traditions. The rabbi, after a fashion, looked at me when I said, what might the symbols be that we bring to this service? He immediately said, we cannot live with the cross because of the suffering that the cross has meant to the Jewish people. The Muslim said, we cannot live with the Star of David. The Hindu said, we can live with almost anything. <laughs> <laughs> and the Buddhist said nothing. <laughs> My own Protestant privilege and naive generosity desired a stance of inclusiveness, but with little consciousness of what I was doing. Each one of us was trying to be faithful to his or her tradition and to our own faith tradition while at the same time trying to figure out how to be authentically together. It was one of the most important lessons I learned in those 22 years, if not in fact my whole life. Tenets of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam include moral precepts of justice. <clears throat> And I will talk about justice and I will talk about social justice uh, just to make a finer point. Justice is taught in each tradition with similar and distinctive attributes. <clears throat> what is it that faith traditions teach about justice? I am very appreciative to the work of Rabbi Sid Schwartz and Dr. Saeed Kutbi whose contributions were critical in the preparation of this uh, presentation. Rabbi Schwartz has a book and some articles entitled Judaism and Justice, The Jewish Passion to Repair the World, along with the work of Dr. Kutz, whose uh, book is entitled Social Justice in Islam. 
both of which helped me articulate and clarify some of the core values of the traditions. All of the Abrahamic traditions teach that humankind is made in the image of God. That is a very important principle because a great deal derives from that. You know that in the Hebrew scripture, the Genesis creation story is about the creation of humankind in the image of God. And there is also the concept of mending the world or repairing the world. The Quranic scripture teaches that the universe is under the care of the creator and that justice is understood to promote physical health, spiritual enlightenment, and moral rightness. Derived from the understanding that humankind is created in the image of God, the dignity of all is a principle. Made in the image of God bestows upon all of humankind dignity. When we treat others with dignity, we in fact pay respect to God. All of the Abrahamic traditions, and I actually would add others, all teach the dignity of all crea creatures and the respect from all creation. Now that is a really good principle, but living that out becomes a little bit harder. One day I was sitting at Barnes and Noble, you know, in many parts of the world they're not independent bookstores anymore. Uh, I was sitting on the curb with my six-year-old grandson. We had just purchased books, which is one of our favorite things to do. We were sitting outside, and it was a warm and sunny day, and he said, do you want to do something for the earth? And I thought, well, probably, but I don't know what it is. And I said, well, what should we do for the earth? And he said, we should pick up all this trash. <laughs> So we went around the parking lot and picked up the trash. That is a way of caring and respecting creation. And then there is the issue of the care of all the creatures. In Judaism and Islam, this is expressly religious in several ways, but one that I want to highlight tonight is in the how that animals are slaughtered for food how food is prepared, and what is consumed into the body. Impure meat, uh, which involves how the meat is slaughtered, matters. Abstinence from alcohol matters. Not drinking unclean water matters. And not smoking tobacco matters. Christians, on the other hand, have not done as well with those. Uh, we do not <laughs> have halakhic or uh, kashrut, actually, in our traditions, even though some may and some may not. And it is a time in our world and in our life where young people are really taking these issues more seriously. The, uh, the Judaic and the Quranic texts place more emphasis on also how animals are slaughtered. And if anybody wants to talk about that tonight, we have people who know more about that than I do, but it is certainly a worthwhile conversation. John Wesley, I will add for my Methodist brothers and sisters who are here tonight, in 1760 did write about the concern for animals. He wrote an essay on the souls of animals, which was published in a little pamphlet called A Survey on the Wisdom of God in Creation, in which he stated that the Bible was clear that animals would be redeemed by God and that Christians should be concerned about the cruelties inflicted on them in, in the streets. I was happy to learn that. Second value that I want to talk about is that of loving kindness. We hear that in prayers and in other scriptures from all three traditions, but how compassion is expressed is really important. So how is it that loving kindness is expressed? 
It knows not national, ethnic, racial, or religious boundaries. And there are examples of that in the text, and I want to show you in a few minutes a couple of examples of how a multi-faith community dealt with that. The third value is you shall not stand idly by. You shall not stand idly by. The fourth is that the ways of peace are essential in all three traditions. The fifth is loving the stranger. And I would highlight a few of the texts because that is an important issue that I know that you are dealing with here in this community and I in Washington and others around the world. Loving the stranger is mandated in Deuteronomy 10, guiding Jewish and Christians, and all three have an ethic of protecting the vulnerable. We see it in Christian texts, in addition, in, in the New Testament in Luke 19 and in Hebrews, when we hear about hospitality being expressed because you do not know who may come as angels unaware. The principle and the concept basically is, is that the outsider is the one who needs protection. The outsider is the one that we must care for. The test of any faith tradition is to the extent to which it helps its adherents understand that the ultimate act of religious fidelity is seeing to it that all of God's children can enjoy the blessing of liberty, economic opportunity, and the freedom to act on the dictates of their conscience. I'll say a little bit more about that in just a minute, but we would understand in the Methodist tradition, and I think in most traditions, that migration is a human right, and I will talk about that in just a little while. So these are some of the principles of the three traditions around justice, and now I want to move a little bit more into issues around and dive a little deeper into social justice which arguably is a later articulated category of justice, but that each tradition continues to deepen and articulate in their own particular ways, but that are very similar. Social justice is a faith-based imperative in all of the three traditions. These involve issues like the fair and uh, just relations between individuals and society. What are the rights and responsibilities of the individual and what rights and responsibilities are there for the society? And those things are always in tension. Number two, uh, what is the distribution of wealth and the opportunity per for personal activity? How is wealth to be handled or to be managed for what purpose and to what end, and how does it um, promote personal activity? The third is each tradition has principles for the equitable distribution of resources and caring for the vulnerable. In the Christian text, we certainly know the Good Samaritan, uh, Hebrews, uh, Luke 19, and many other stories, Matthew 5, many of the ways in which Jesus instructed the community for the equitable sharing of resources. There is then the issue of equality and the common good. Um, I have not teased that out, but that might be something that you'd like to talk about. And third, the narrowing of the gap between the rich and the poor not taxing the poor beyond measure is another uh, example of social justice. Jesus, you will remember, went to the home of Zacchaeus, the wee little man. <laughs> you remember that? And uh, he went, to, as some of you know, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and he promised that not only would he give back half of his wealth, but for anyone that he had cheated, that he would uh, quadruple the gift back. And so it's an example of Jesus' teaching on not taxing beyond measure. 
All of the traditions have some tenets that protect human rights, even though the language in, as such is not in the text exactly that way, but I think is derivative and um, can be thought about as the language of human rights comes it more into the modern world um, <clears throat> in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, freedom of conscience is an appropriate and an important social justice in all of the traditions, and, but I think lived out in different ways, and that might be another topic that we would like to talk about. The last is uh, that all of the traditions talk about love God um, and love your neighbor so that the love of neighbor is very similar to the love of God, and the love of God is similar to the love of neighbor. So that all, of the, the, all three of the traditions would have that as a social justice concept. So now I wanna move into a little bit more visual way of thinking about some of these issues um, and how we live justice. And I am doing this by way of example more than I am doing it in a, a normative kind of way. Coming together for the sake of justice. I am going to show you a series of slides and tell you some small stories. Uh, all of these slides um, have in them people of several traditions doing different things. This, we had a program at Emory which still exists called Journeys. And the purpose of Journeys was to look at the root causes of conflict and learn about how communities deal with conflict and how they move beyond it. Uh, and sometimes we saw communities that moved beyond, the, uh, beyond conflict and often we saw communities that were still living with sometimes war and conflict. This was a group of multi-faith students, students from many different traditions, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Jewish, uh, and I think some agnostics and maybe an athe atheist in that group, um, in Cuba. Uh, at that time, uh, people who were U.S. citizens could not easily travel to Cuba, and we had a very hard time getting documents to go to Cuba if you, um, <coughs> You had to go through Mexico or through Canada. This was when N1H1 came, and so this group had a very hard time traveling, but finally got to Cuba and spent a week there in conversation with many faith communities, addressing the issues of, of conflict and poverty and democracy and not democracy in Cuba. Uh, it was interesting that the Jewish community and the Muslim communities were both very strong. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church was stronger than we would have been led to believe in the U.S., actually. Um, but this was a multi-faith group of students in Cuba studying um, that situation. The second, this picture, this photograph was taken a couple of years ago. And this is another example of how we live faith. I have called this honoring the earth and respecting indigenous peoples. Uh, I went to Standing Rock in September as uh, the situation was heightening in, at Standing Rock. There were people of all religious traditions there supporting the communities, many communities. And this was a boat um, that had come all the way from the Northwest, from Washington State, that had made its way to Standing Rock as a witness um, to justice and opposing, of course, the pipeline and standing with the indigenous peoples at Standing Rock. It was one of the most meaningful things that I have um, had the good fortune to do, to stand with people for a few days of all different traditions with people who really needed the solidarity to be together for that particular um, time as we thought about how is it that we as people of faith honor the earth and how is it that we respect indigenous peoples. This picture um, is of the Interreligious Council. 
I don't think anybody in this room is in this picture. Um, but this was the Interreligious Council at one of its closing um, meals of the year. They met every week and they ate together. And eating is a difficult thing on the one hand, and it's a very simple thing on the other. All you have to do is serve vegetarian food. And everybody can come. <laughs> this was at a Thai restaurant, and there are Muslims of several traditions, there are Jews of several traditions, there are Christians of several traditions, there is a Jain, uh, there are a couple of Hindus, and there are some Christians in this group. So uh, this group had been together at least for one year, some of them for longer, and they were the closest of friends and would often choose to be together, not just for that one time a week, but they played together and traveled together and did many things uh, together. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides of all time. These are four students. The man in the red jacket is a Buddhist monk. The woman beside him is an Orthodox Jew. The woman beside her is an Orthodox Christian from Lebanon and part of her family from Syria. And the woman beside her is Muslim. We were on a trip in Washington and we had gone down to the 9-11 memorial and as you can see by the umbrellas, it was a rainy and cold and dreary March day. And they were standing together for no particular reason except that they like each other. And one of them said to the other, we need to do something. What can we do? And one of them said, we should each say a prayer. Uh, if there's any image of my life that I hold in my heart is this one. Um, it was such a spontaneous moment and it was such a precious moment and such an important story. They're all working for justice in one way or another. Um, Nwang has gone back um, to um, India where he is in the monastery. I, I won't get into all that, but they're all doing justice work. <laughs> Uh, this slide is the one that relates to not standing idly by. This picture was taken a little over a year and a half ago at a prayer vigil outside of the Methodist building in Washington. It was a couple of days after the Pulse nightclub shooting. And there I am with Rabbi Jonah Pesner and with Dr. Saeed Saeed. We, all the ribbons that you see are the ribbons for all who died in that shooting. Um, and we were all three doing a blessing together, uh, remembering the horrible effects of gun violence and how that we cannot stand idly by and how it is really important to stand with one another. If there is one admonition that I have for you, uh, it would be that it is important for us to stand together before things happen rather than after they happen. So showing up matters a great deal. So when things unfortunately happen in a mosque or around a Jewish cemetery or in a Christian church or in a Gudwara or in a temple, a Hindu temple, it is important for us to stand with one another when those um, horrible things happen so that we do not have to have this prayer vigil uh, after things happen. Uh, this photograph is Living the Ways of Peace. Um, this was a group, uh, again, in the Journeys program of Hindus, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Yep, uh, who were traveling together in the West Bank and in Israel. Uh, it was not hard. Um, again, they, this group had been friends for a long time. They had done interfaith work together for a long time. 
but they were able to be together in the West Bank. And this picture actually is taken at uh, Tantour, which is right on the line between the West Bank and Israel, as they studied the issues of the whole region and the territory. So living the ways of peace uh, is supporting one another as we learn and as we walk together. The last, this is a fun um, photo. This is with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Loving the Stranger. Um, these are chaplains from across the U.S. Uh, who happened to be at Emory the week that His Holiness the Dalai Lama came. So these are religious leaders all in colleges and universities across the U.S. that came together um, to meet with His Holiness as well as to be with one another for a time of study. I want to say just a word about the ethic of vulnerability, which I uh, took this from um, Rabbi Schwartz as he talked about the vulnerability ethic, where Gentiles who live among Jews are required to be protected. They are vulnerable because they are there without ties of religion, nation, and culture. So the concept is that the outsider has to be protected. Uh, it's a beautiful and important ethic, and it's one that I think is really good for us to think about. I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Um, this was also the trip to um, the West Bank and to Israel. Uh, the tall man is uh, the Jewish advisor who is now in San Diego, and the dark-haired woman is Aisha Hadutala, who teaches Islam at the University of San Francisco, and I am the sleepy one in the middle. <laughs> We're standing on Mount Nebo. Um, and there is a love of once when we were strangers and now we are friends. The issues that I would like to just quickly articulate, that while all of us affirm the dignity and value of all people growing out of our own faith traditions, we know that there are challenges. So how do we continue to treat people who live in poverty and how can we do that together? The root causes of poverty must be addressed in the U.S. and in many countries around the world. We have to understand more deeply the root causes of poverty, and we have to think imaginatively together about ways to address poverty. Mission is not enough. Soup kitchens keep people from starving, but they do not alleviate the causes of hunger. The causes of poverty and the stigma of poverty calls to all of us, and we must be in that together. The second challenge is how do we extend full rights to all women, particularly poor women, but to all women, how will we stand together to ensure full rights to all women around the world? The third challenge is how do we address racism, tribalism, and colonialism? <laughs> that could take a little while, uh, but it is an issue that we must, uh, as the human family, continue to address, to understand more deeply, and to live out um, a way in which it is more faithful. <clears throat> and the fourth challenge is how do we work together on issues of migration and immigration? I saw recently a documentary called uh, Human Flow. If you have not seen it, I hope that you will. It would be a wonderful way for the interfaith communities to come together here and to think about migration in ways in which uh, you can be in so solidarity together on many of the issues that migrants and immigrants and refugees face. As people of faith on this journey, we are set apart for the work of love and justice. It is what we are all called to do. I attended the installation of Rabbi Pesner, who was at the prayer vigil uh, when he was inducted and installed. And he noted in his remarks that we, as people of faith, are set apart for more responsibility for love and justice. So, as people of faith on this journey, going on our, to our own new countries with one another, we must always love, we must always be compassionate, and we must always live out justice. 
I want to conclude with going back to the Emory story and that first interfaith service. Those colleagues are dear friends of mine and of each other. These relationships were extraordinary. And over the years, I and we learned so much and our relationships grew and our communities benefited. The symbols that we chose that week were the gifts from the, each of the traditions. We used water, we used wheat, we had all the sacred texts, and we had bells. We each were able to claim our own faith tradition, our identities, our voices, and our presence. And it was like Abraham or Sarah going into an unknown country. We do share in common the call of God to leave the place where we are secure and give up our idols if we have any, but not give up our faith and broaden our ancestral ties and our kinship and our friendship to go in a new way. And the God of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Ishmael will go ahead of us to watch over us on our journey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that inspiring word. We're going to have a couple of responses now, and then we're going to open up for questions and answers. And uh, first will be Imam uh, Moaz Redzik, who is the Imam at the uh, Boston, uh, at the Bosnian Cultural Center. Uh, do you want to take a place here? And then following him will be Marlene Kowalski Brown, who's the Assistant Vice President for Inclusion and Student Affairs at Grand Valley State University, and one of my colleagues. So. So speaking of justice and, and of course social justice, um, I'll start with the very much repeated and well-known verse from the Quran in the translation of meanings where God says, oh people, we have created you from a single male and a female and divided you and made you into tribes and nations so that you may know one another and indeed or verily the best amongst you is the one who is the most God-fearing. So there is that equality in humanity between every human being before God, with no difference in race, gender, ethnicity, religion, whatever. All of us were created by God. That's kind of the first principle there. Based on that, the second principle would be, again, something that comes directly from God, uh, and that is justice itself. God, indeed, and I'm translating the meanings of the, of, the, of the verse from the Quran, indeed, God commands justice and goodness. So, being just is being a good believer in God as direct as it as it as it gets based on this verse from the Quran that is by the way repeated by every imam in every friday speech towards the end of the sermon this very verse every friday in every mosque um, and the third verse would be based on these two the principle from the Qur'an that is now the duty upon the believers where God says to the community of believers you are the best community in joining or commanding what is right and forbidding what is evil and believing in God so this principle of commanding the right and forbidding the evil is a driving motivation for justice 
everlasting. So those are the three Quranic principles. And the one I picked for tonight from the prophetic tradition, because there are two major sources in Islam, the Quran, which is the soul of Islam, and the Hadith, um, the prophetic words, which is the body. So together making uh, the full source of, of the embodiment of the Quran would be the Hadith, basically. So the tradition from the Prophet says, whoever sees a... Uh, bad or an evil or a wrong thing, let him change it with his hand first. And if he's not able to do so, let him change it with his, change it with his tongue, speak against it. And if he cannot do that even, let him be against it in his heart. So never ever stand idly by. But he's, he pointed, very interesting in this very tradition from the Prophet, he said at the end, but that is the weakest of the believers, the one who is just not agreeing with it but can't do anything, which tells us that we have to do something, at least speak against it. So those are the, the principles. Uh, then two questions, ideas, food for thought. One, migration as, as a human right Many historians t today and, and, and in the past, I'd say today, agree that greatest civilizations on earth that we know of have been bro b born out of migration. And Islam is no exception because the religion of Islam, the, the the way of the Prophet uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, the, the revelation started in Mecca, but it really gained a foothold, gained a um, the real beginning or the rebirth with the migration to Medina. So that enabled the first Muslim community to show its full potential, that migration. And a few centuries later, uh, another migration happened, to be more precise, it actualized itself in 1776, which created another great Im endeavor of humankind, again based on migration. So that's one. And then the other, we're talking about justice tonight, but to be fair and just to the, the whole picture of the Islamic um, um, take on this principle, justice does never go alone. It is seen as one leg, and the other leg is mercy. So it always comes hand in hand with mercy. Because think of someone who has done something wrong. Does he or she want justice or mercy? And it's a, it's a tough question not always easy to answer. Um, we all want mercy, but we all want justice. So the ultimate justice we as believers believe will be not here. That is why we want mercy and we want that justice to be controlled in our hearts by mercy. So let's just not forget about mercy when we talk about justice as well. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, uh, something that we can build. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. So as Doug said, my name is Marlene Kowalski-Braun, and I'm going to take a very different perspective. Uh, in my invitation in coming here, I come to you as a layperson. My framework for reacting to Susan and Moaz's um, wonderful perspectives uh, is as a higher education professional. So I come with humility, with a deep curiosity for this work, and would like to just talk about what social justice through an interfaith lens and the comments that Susan made might mean for students on a campus. 
So in starting, I just want to talk about uh, intersectionality and its connection to interfaith. And as I was thinking about the stories that Susan told and the pictures that she shared, I saw intersectionality come alive. And intersectionality through the division of inclusion and equity comes out of the Kambahi River Collective, which was a group of black women who wanted to complicate this sort of monolith understanding of what woman was. And out of that intersectionality lens, we came to understand that multiple identities, including interfaith, spiritual, and secular identities, matter to people, right? That we are not but one thing. We're not our gender. We're not our race. We're many things. And so we use this intersectional lens um, through the lens of interfaith in higher education to create space for students who have not felt welcome on campus. So through the social justice language that Susan used, she talked about being other often, being on the outside in the margins. We believe at GVSU that using an interfaith lens allows us to pull students in who otherwise have been on the margins, right? Students who are not Christian, for example, or students whose faith tradition may not be fully represented on the campus. I want to, um, react to this idea of the common good that was clearly throughout Susan's um, remarks. So if public education is considered a higher good, the calling that we have to stimulate in young people is to be able to go out and make the world better, right? And the lens that we often use in public higher education is the lens of a liberal education, what it means to create critical thinkers what it means to help people have relationships with diverse others, to be involved in problem solving. But I'm going to challenge that another lens that we can use on a public campus is the lens of interfaith, of religion, spirituality, and secular worldview to actually motivate that kind of servant leadership, that willingness to engage in the world. So right now, on a lot of college campuses, we miss an opportunity to pull students into that deeper level of purpose. And I think that what this conversation offers around social justice is that interfaith is a place where that indeed can happen. Susan also talked about loving kindness, not standing idly by, and loving the stranger. It's probably no surprise to you that a college campus is a microcosm of the society. And therefore, on campuses, we find hate, and we find injustice, and we find microaggressions, and we find bias. And the tools to fight those often come out of young people's uh, traditions, the faith traditions that they have learned. The motivation to sit with people that you don't know, to learn about the other, and to also acknowledge within a space of humility when someone has done something that has harmed another person. So I think that interfaith lens offers that. I guess the last thing I just wanted to share was, um, as the layperson on the panel, my own journey to this and why I think this is so significant. When I was young, I went to a Catholic school, K through 12. I then went to a public institution. And I thought that that journey that I had had through K-12 could be nurtured in that space. And what I found was that this important, significant aspect of who I was was completely left out of the conversation. That just when I was about to embark on all of the big questions in life, there was no one to discuss it because higher education had decided that the distance between religion, spirituality, and secular worldview had to be very distant from the education process. And so I felt really alone in that. When I graduated from college, I went to work for the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith. And this is a Jewish organization that was deeply involved in civil human rights. Many of you probably know the ADL. And I had the honor of working under the tutelage of Dick Lobenthal, who was um, an absolute legend on the east side of the state. I learned from a man who had infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan and who taught me not just about Judaism and anti-Semitism, but more deeply about my own faith, about the intersection of race and class and all aspects of identity. And so I recognized after that experience and going back to higher education that part of social justice is interfaith.
for young people. It is creating the mechanisms on college campuses and in other spaces for young people to not have to leave that behind, but to, able, but to be able to actually bring that with them and keep that as a significant part of who they, who they are. So I'll, I'll leave my comments um, at that. I guess a question that I would like to, um, to pose for our discussion is that often when young people hear about interfaith discussion and coming together, they readily look for the common the commonality, right? The place of common understanding. And that's a natural human response, to want to find the thing that you're most like with another person. But social justice re work requires sitting in the spaces of tension and in the spaces of disagreement. And so I would like to just um, offer as part of the discussion how we actually also hold that space in this interfaith work to actually grapple with deep issues that we may deeply disagree about um, and what that means for this kind of social justice work. So thank you. Okay, to begin our discussion, I'll ask Susan to respond to Marlene's question. Sure. And, if you, and if you, as we're gonna have a little bit of discussion between our panelists and then we'll open it up. Is it on now? Yes. Okay. Um, I think, thank you both for your comments. I really appreciated um, the Quranic texts uh, on justice and the ways in which you talked about that and also um, pushed a little more on migration as a human right and a gift actually <laughs> to the civilization. So thank you. Um, Marlene, I think that you're exactly right, that uh, commonality is really important and distinction is maybe even more important uh, because that is about identity um, and identities. So I really appreciate you raising that question. One of the, I showed this slide about um, Israel and the West Bank deliberately because that was one of the experiences where there was great distinction, not political, but religious distinction and identity. And believing that um, in that particular group that some Jewish students, and they did not have all the same narratives, any of them, uh, but the Jewish students had a variety of narratives, the Muslim students had a variety of narratives, the Christian students had a variety of narratives, and the best student that helped the conversation was a Hindu student uh, because she did not have ownership in the same way that everybody else assumed ownership. So the distinctions in that particular group were, ver were very important. So that was one example, and it was the reason that I chose that slide, uh, hoping that we might get to talk about that. Um, and I made some comments tonight that I think you should challenge, and one, uh, I didn't say that they were the same, but I did say that halakhic and uh, kosher practices were similar. They are similar, but they are not the same. And so I think that's another place of distinction that could be teased down and articulated. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, kind of general things that I said that just need to be teased out in terms of particularity. Yeah. Any other responses? <coughs> um, <coughs> might just add a little bit to the, the, the notion of, of uh, migration and, and justice. The ownership of justice uh, kind of was, was, was mentioned here uh, right now. And, and I think that's one of the crucial questions here. We all like uh, the idea of social justice, and that's intrinsic in human nature, but who owns justice? That's the question. Who is the ultimate um, decision maker? What is just and what is unjust? Now, generally speaking, uh, when it comes to, I'd like to bring one, one kind of historical context here um, from, some of the 
Muslim scholarship um, in the last century or so, where the majority of, of Muslim historians have come to uh, uh, not just a conclusion, but, but a principle uh, when, in which they said that God will allow, and I'm paraphrasing this, I'm not quoting it, however, the, so God will allow system of rule of any religious background as long as it is or non-religious basically any kind of rule as long as there is no injustice if the system is full of injustice God will not allow it to last you can call it Muslim you can call it Christian you can call it whatever you like but if it's not just to the people God will not let it last so God will hold a, hold us humans in that interpretation of that principle accountable to be just to each other especially those who have power over us as long as they're not unjust that can last. But once the injustice appears, that just does not last. So I think that speaks for itself as, as far as who owns justice. One of the, I want to respond to Marlene's question, because one of the issues that we face in our interfaith work is this idea <coughs> that we're all trying to be the same. And that's not true at all. We are trying to be different and to respect each other's differences. We won't learn a lot if we just create a big echo chamber called interfaith. Interfaith to the Kaufman Institute and everything we've been doing in the community and on the campuses means affirming the differences, affirming those things that we don't agree on, affirming that but doing it in a way that is respectful and is accepting of the humanity and the goodwill of the person that we're engaging with. But at this point, let's open up for questions. Uh, we have people with mics available, so who would like to be first? Here. Imam Saab Zada. I'm Saab Zada from Islamic Center, and director of Islamic Center and Imam as well. I appreciate that you have brought so many uh, points to pay attention and all the respondents. But the main thing is that we are doing interfaith work and Doug is the leader in, in Grand Rapids. Uh, our youths are not participating in these activities. What should have we to do as a social justice, uh, social thing to bring up? Because in every gathering or in interfaith meeting or even there is no work going on uh, generally in the uh, universities and colleges and schools. What are those reasons and instigation that we bring youths towards uh, interfaith? Uh, this is uh, uh, the most important issue of uh, social justice as well, I think. It's a very important question. And one of the things that I have seen more recently in my work in Washington is that people will not necessarily, young people will not necessarily come around if you, they, if you invite them to an interfaith gathering. But if you say, today we will talk about food sustainability, healthy food, and climate, they will be there. So it, it's how it's framed and how it's invited. So I think for those of us of my generation that <laughs> we can't say we want you to come because we think interfaith is a great idea. Uh, we do think that's a great idea. But that my perception is that young people are much more committed to the issues and they will talk about the sources of food and God and how we care for creation. So that 
is sort of my comment, and maybe some young people would like to respond to that. <laughs> Can we just take this? Yeah, that'd be easier. So I'll welcome any comments um, from the audience, but I, I wanted to say that it's true that as young people have been polled, college students in particular, they identify less with denomination and certainly with institutions, right? The trust of institutions, the ability to believe that that's actually where change can happen. Um, so I'm not sure what this is gonna mean for our work down the road around calling this campus interfaith resources, but every time we talk about interfaith, we explain what we mean. And what we mean is religious, spiritual, and secular traditions and worldviews. The fact that we have to explain it, right, might mean that the word itself is, is not complicated enough, that young people don't see themselves in it, but I also fully appreciate with what Susan said that I am not lacking hope for the commitment that young people have to addressing the issues of social justice. I think the way that they have been invited and their very worthy critique and distrust of the systems that have been left to really address these things that have systematically not done that, have really left young people looking for where are those places. I, I do think interfaith spaces can be part of that, but I think we need to invite them differently and with their language. Question back here? Ethan, Ethan. Oh, please. Oh, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say I like uh, that you guys are like including us because um, louder, closer oh, to the I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to say yeah, like thank you. But um, anyway, um, I will say uh, at the beginning of the year, I knew nothing about like this particular program or any of these uh, conversations. And my friend right next to me, she um, got me over in here, and uh, and I came to a couple events, and like I didn't even know what secular uh, a secular view was. And um, once somebody explained it to me, it kind of like uh, just clicked in my mind that it really is like a disconnect with language because when I'm thinking about interfaith, I'm thinking about like this is really gonna be about um, someone from each religion trying to like, you know, shove it down your throat. And um, <laughs> conversion. And basically, uh, I feel like for the um, younger children to um, start uh, coming to more events like this, it really does have to um, be like a, a language shift, but it's also um, from my experience, um, there is a lot of uh, disconnect between each other. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessarily um, even religion. It could be, uh, it can go far out from religion because I can walk down the hallway and I can say hello to everybody with a smile on my face, but not everyone is gonna look at me. Some people look at the ground, some people are looking at their phone, and some people are already in groups where they're like comfortable. Mm -hmm. So I really feel like um, it's really about like, um, it's, it's it's mainly about how we approach uh how we approach uh like um how do i say our body language our body language to people and um find the right words because every group is different and for them to for us to all come together we have to find that one truth that we all want and it's to have justice mm -hmm. but my question is like what <laughs> what can what would you consider um is there is there a possibility that there can be injustice that lasts longer than it should? I mean, I, I'll take a very quick comment just to say yes. I mean, <laughs> racism has lasted way too long. Uh, so, I mean, sexism, I mean, there are many things, Islamophobia, injustice, if it lasts one day, it's too long. So, and I think the point um, that the Imam is making is that justice belongs to God and that it is our job uh, to be sure that injustice is corrected. So, injustice lasts too long if it lasts <laughs> at all. If I may add one thing is religions, at least, uh, Dr. Susan can correct me if I'm wrong, but Christianity and Islam and I, I believe Judaism all 
are there to, to teach us to find peace in ourselves, among other things. So seeing injustice around us in our world, lasting for way too long in t way too many aspects, and you just named a few, uh, is very disturbing. But how can we find peace in ourselves as believers? Well, from my religious tradition and my understanding of my religious tradition, I think, <coughs> as long as I do everything that I can, I find peace in that. There, is, there are two things here that, that we're taught. The sphere of concern and the sphere of influence. And they are very different. So our sphere of influence is first and foremost ourselves. So the change to justice comes from the inside. And when it comes to change, the Quranic principle again is we have to change ourselves to change, to see the change. Very, very clear there. Now, and then from yourself to your nearest family and friends and acquaintances and people that you're um, having as, 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 as your, you know, people that you live with and, 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 and meet with and, and work with. That's fear of influence. The sphere of concern, quite frankly, is the world. I mean, tonight we're sitting here in this nice room and everything, but speaking of justice, me as a believer, I'm trying to imagine someone who is sitting now somewhere along the border in Arizona, or someone sitting somewhere along the border of Hungary, or someone sitting on the border of Bangladesh you know, these three corners of the world, thinking about what just happened to them and what is it what they, that they want. Being aware of that makes us want to do something. And that's that human in us that we all have. So, so it has to begin with ourselves, but we can't do it by ourselves. Nor can we do it if each of our traditions are fighting each other or trying to do it by themselves. We not only have to come together as individuals, we have to come together as our traditions. Maintaining our differences, but choosing to work together. And that's what interfaith is about. Question here. Thank you. I appreciate that the Abrahamic faiths are coming together. As a secular person, it gives me encouragement that um, these kinds of conversations are happening. And Muaz, I was so moved by what you said about justice and mercy. That was so powerful. And a book that I read by Brian Stevenson is called Just Mercy. He's a lawyer who works in the area of criminal justice. And when he visited Germany, they had a conversation during a speech that he gave, gave about the death penalty, and this relates to the second thing you said that was so powerful. A German lawyer raised her hand and said, in Germany, we do not have the death penalty because we are not just enough as a people. We are not knowledgeable enough as a people to ever be so arrogant as to determine who should be subject to the death penalty because of our history. Look at our history. It was an unjust history. So my question to you is like, you had so much feeling around that, that the only thing that would allow longevity is if the leader of a country, whether secular or religious, was just. What in your own experience made that such a strong comment. Um, well, thank you for, for your comment and, of course, for your question at the end. Um, th these <coughs> two principles, justice and mercy, are seen as perfectly compatible when they are seen as complementary, not separate. And there is one thing that just comes to my mind. 
a tradi tradition from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he names seven kinds of people that he says that will be in, in the shade of God on the Day of Judgment, basically in a special place. And the first one is the just ruler because his responsibility is the greatest. And he showed the greatest principle, which is justice. And then he goes down to say the people who uh, met together and for the sake of God, meaning no worldly interests, just honestly connecting and those who give out. The, way th the one of about giving is quite striking. He said one of those seven categories, the one who gives the way that his left hand doesn't know what his right hand is, is, is doing. Right, so being sincere is what is what what is justice and mercy together, just sincerely acting out without any interest, without any um, even reward from from people, just from God as a believer. That's it. We are all humans. We all you know, the golden rule. And it, it, it's self-explanatory. Just needs us to ponder on it, not even to talk much about it. Other questions? Okay, we'll take one more, and then I'll ask the panelists if you have any final comments that you want to make. Um. So going back to what we were talking about, young folks, um, there is, Marlene brought up, there's a lot of distrust within the institution and inspired by what we were talking about at lunch today. How do you see millennials finding some sort of community within the religious or interfaith, interfaith movement without an institution? How do you see them moving beyond that? I can start. Um, so I'm going to think about some conversations I had with um, Katie Gordon, whom some of you knew, who was doing interfaith work on campus. And what ties young people to those faith traditions, if not the spaces, is the sense of community, right? A, there is a sense of belonging that is actually required for young people to survive on a college campus, to find their higher purpose, to go out into the world post-graduation, and to be global citizens. Like That sense of belonging needs to exist. And what we have increasingly found is that sense of belonging is lacking. Um, we see it in mental health issues, we see it in our inability to retain young people, and part of that is community. That's what they're longing. And that's what I think the interfaith work brings on a college campus. It's a different way of being together. It's a much more intimate way of being together. In some ways, young people are connected all over the place, and yet they're lonely. So it calls this sort of deeper, meaning of asking the big questions in life and sitting and grappling in a way that isn't like a one second text, but it actually requires a conversation and being in the room together. So those are my thoughts. Okay, why don't we, uh, the final comments, so Susan, we'll start with you and then. Uh, thank you all for um, receiving this conversation so warmly. Um, I think sort of in summary that uh, what I appreciate about the conversation with you all tonight is for us to continue to think about what this inner peace is and how out of our traditions or no tradition we continue to find that kind of peace that extends to ourselves and our worlds and the ripples of all of that. The second is how we uh, find a sense of belonging and including so that we are looking for a place to belong and that there are people who need to belong to us. So belonging and including. And the third is a sense of purpose 
uh, which does relate to this justice and mercy question, um, a purpose for the world. Uh, so it's not just my own purpose in life, but how, what is my contribution uh, that I can make to the world. So I think those are the final things that I would want to say. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go back uh, for a second on the two spheres. I mentioned the sphere of concern and the sphere of influence. So in, in the work of social justice and justice in general, um, for everybody who is sincere about it, in the sphere of influence, it is the, the good work. It is spreading, spreading the positive um, vibrations with um, the inclusiveness. With, with that sincerity, being just, being kind to those that, that are around us. Um, that's the sphere of influence. And the sphere of concern, f uh, for me as a believer, and um, every other believer, I'm pretty sure, uh, there's this powerful tool that is called prayer. So we pray that change comes uh, soon. Um, and I'm sure that God answers prayers from the sincere ones, for sure. Thank you. So my closing comments are, again, in going back to sort of the frame that I bring to this conversation, which is we want our campuses to be full, filled with students who can be their full, authentic selves, and we want the world to be full of those people as well. And part of being your full self um, includes this important interfaith piece. And when I think about the kind of courageous leadership that is needed in active bystander t behavior, uh, to be, as Susan said, engaged in the work of doing justice, not just thinking about it, um, I think that that connection to faith and spirituality uh, is deeply a part of that and that even in public higher education, we need to create more room for young people and all of us to be able to engage in those ways in all aspects of, of who we are. Thank you, each of, each of the panelists, and Susan particularly for your presentation. Another way to build community is to eat together. So I'm hoping to see you a week from tonight at the Abrahamic dinner at the Jewish Temple Emmanuel. It is a wonderful community bonding experience. But let's thank our panelists and speakers. Good evening.